Hey there, it's Andre with the Impulsive Thinker podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Kadak, the Center of ADHD Awareness Canada. Today I have again Santina Mosgal. Mosgal, whoops, sorry, Santina Mosgal. Um, on again, you would you re- you'd recognize her from talking about emotions and ADHD and how the ADHD brain feels emotions intensely. Um, and we have her back to talk more about emotions. How are you doing, Santina? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Andre? Very good. I'm excited about this topic because it's something that's not very well understood. It's by a lot of physicians, uh, psychiatry practitioners, or even ADHD people in general. And I, for me, it's always, it's been a big thing. It's a big part of my life, these intense emotions. Yeah, so I'm I'm so excited that you have me back to to talk about this a little bit more. Um, and it, you know, the last time we spoke, it was it was very you know technical, um, some, uh, very scientificy for a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and today, what I I think would be nice to know is, is sort of like uh, what what has been your personal experience with having uh, emotion dysregulation with your ADHD in your work environment. So I I don't know if you were able to talk about it, um, you know, prior to being diagnosed and treated and, you know, maybe after, like if there was a difference. Oh yeah. Huge, huge difference. And in short, the difference is, is awareness. That's one. So we'll get back to that later. So before diagnosis, it was rampant, rampant emotional outbursts, uh, spazzy is what I've been accused of. Um, you know, I don't have a filter, the impulsive reactions, uh, whatever came to mind was said. Yeah. Um, and with my staff, primarily, it was really bad because if it wasn't going the way I expected it, I would react and be very loud, rude, um, you know it's screaming at times um and that affects the relationships you know even with clients who calling me out of the blue for no reason and something really silly and dumb i'd react (laughs) and i react and call them idiots i would just say you know i don't have time for this crap right now because i'm way behind on the stuff that i should have been working on and all these self-induced last minute projects that i deadlines that i waited to the last minute um, and like you were mentioning last time, like the higher stress the body is, the more reactive I was. Yeah. And reactive, I think, is an understatement. Uh, explosive would have been another good term to use. Yeah. It was explosive at time. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Explosive at home, explosive at work, yeah. explosive yeah. with friends. Um, yeah. And that always has a negative effect on relationships, right? And as was- an entrepreneur, mm-hmm building a business all about relationships client staff and home is a big important one yeah 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 and with yourself like what are you talking about myself i don't have a good relationship with myself before (laughs) diagnosis oh no and i think that's where a lot of us we don't have a good relationship with ourselves and that's a very great point because with all these emotional I, you know, you're, everyone says, oh, you should got, you have to learn to control your emotions. You're too emotive. You're too sensitive. You're not like everyone else. Then you take that on as yourself as a moral failing that you can, you know, you, we try hard. We try hard, yeah. very, very, very hard to not to control those, but we can't. So that means I'm a failure. So I can't do like everyone else. Yeah. So, but, so what would happen, say, if you had an outburst at work and and you like really lost your cool, like how, how long would it take you to come down from that? Days. Yeah. I've, I've had it where it's days, not yeah. only work at home. Um, but yeah, it just, it just, you stay pissed off. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a lot to do with the new negative rumination that our brain likes to do that hamster mm-hmm. wheel keeps reminding you about this. But mm-hmm. now that I'm talking more out loud about this, Santina, I think, it, I think it had to, like you brought up the last time we talked, you talked a lot about shame. I never really paid a lot of attention to that shame part, but mm-hmm. I think the calm down has to do more about 
getting over the shame of that reaction more than the reaction. Because the other analogy is we feel these emotions intensely. Mm -hmm. They're there and then they're gone. Just like shaking up a pop bottle. You open it up, it goes fizz. That's yeah. the emotion. There's the reaction. Mm -hmm. And then it's gone within a second. And that's how a lot of our emotions as ADHD people, mm -hmm. it works. It's there and then it's gone. But the shame part sticks around a lot longer. Yeah. I, th I think there's an interesting correlation there. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's huge. It's what yeah. I it's what I work on. It's one of the main pieces that I will work on with people when it comes to uh, to to uh, learn emotion regulation, which is the opposite of being emotionally dysregulated. Mm -hmm. When you dysregulate it is when you have no control, you don't feel in control, or you're not acting out the proper urge for that emotion. So like the, the urge for sadness is to cry and can, like to get into a quiet space but still to connect with somebody. That's why we physically show tears. It's to draw in somebody so that we can connect with them. But what happens sometimes is you're like, you have this crying sensation, you're sad, you have this urge to connect with people. So you're like, uh, yeah, I need to be with people. Let's all go to the pub in the loudest place. And I'm totally cool now. I'm totally cool right. now. Yeah. Right. And that's that's acting out um, the urge of happiness, which is connecting with people and being in a boisterous environment. Mm -hmm. That's not sadness. Sadness is you you should be actually acting it out in a quiet space. So so, you know, when you're dysregulated, you're either you're acting out something else. Maybe you're feeling sad, but you're acting out anger. You're feeling shame, but you're acting out anger or sadness. Right. So, you know, part of the whole process is learning what is that emotion? How does it feel in my body? And what does it need to do? But the other part, um, Andre, that I'm wondering when you're talking about feeling, you know, it taking like two days to calm down. Yes, shame is in there, but I feel that that shame is probably there at the, the end part of it. Yeah. At the beginning part, that anger in your body. Like, how does it feel when you're like in a meeting and you're just like, you know, oh, like, how could you say that dumb answer, right? Like, it's an intense. It's overwhelming. And yeah. It feels like you're, the body's being filled up and it's almost levitating me off the chair at times. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and then some in a, in a fast paced work environment, such as as you know engineering or something like that you know uh you you don't always have the chance to do what that anger wants to do with that energy mm -hmm. which is maybe run or or, yeah. or you know uh, uh and if you can't run then you're cornered and then it amplifies it there you go right, right. and so it, you're 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 not having this this chance for your body to physiologically come back down to this resting state you don't have the time at your work environment so so that you're coming home and then you're still you yes you have an overactive imagination and still overactive. ramped up yep. so you're still ramped up and you're feeding all these your brain can think of a billion things of of why you should be angry, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever it is that's going on. And, and probably as your body maybe is starting to try and calm down out of it, you're trying to work your way down out of it. That is usually when that shame will pop up. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, sh and shame's urge, its purpose is from an evolutionary standpoint is to avoid and 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 uh and and hide in a rock that's why we slump down when we're feeling right shame. right that's you know? interesting yeah yeah because here's the other thing too and just you're saying that a lot of times i'll forget what i got pissed off about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a day or two later i just got that feeling so the other thing i heard from you I, i've never even thought of this i never read it anywhere but like um the emotion mm -hmm. 
is not necessarily what you feel. You can have different types of feelings for one emotion. Mm -hmm. and I think most people say a feeling is an emotion, but those mm -hmm. are two different things. Did I hear that right? You got that right. Oh, can you clarify that for me, please? Yeah. Well, so to me, um, the, the feeling and sensations is what you're, it's the physiological reaction of an emotion. An emotion is, um, it is both the thought, the physiological sensations, and the reaction. That's the emotion, the three parts. That's the emotions. And then, you know, the what was the three parts again? I got to write this down. Emotion. That's is, <laughs> so I would say it is, is thought. You said it's part of the thought. Mm -hmm. It it is the physiological reactions. Reaction. Yep. Yeah, like the sensations in the body, mm -hmm. and then it, and then it is the 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 actions. The, like the, the action the, reaction yeah yeah the reaction yeah Action, reaction. Oh, so that's why it's complicated <laughs> there's three dynamic parts to it well it, there is and 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 what we don't know is that they all it, it can it's very so it's complicated but it's actually quite simple when you start looking at they all have each emotion has a common trigger mm -hmm. and it has a common purpose so anger like when my daughter was learning about her anger it you know as opposed to you know, maybe somebody else who doesn't have the emotional intelligence as I do I kept telling her like your anger isn't bad your anger is there to protect you the trigger right. of anger is feeling attacked and the purpose of it from an evolutionary standpoint is to attack back in a safe way in order to keep yourself safe. Right, yeah. Right? But so if you were purely acting in emotional state and not knowing how you're supposed to use it, like in, in you know, how, mm. like, so you, you might not, nobody may have taught you how to attack back in a way that's safe is basically what I'm trying to say. Or to, yeah, to advocate for yourself or to, uh, yeah, you can react back or attack back, but in a way that it's, um, that's effective. That's effective. Not, that's effective, not necessarily and, and, right. Yeah. And, and effective means you're keeping yourself safe and you're keeping other people safe. Yeah. So, and here's the thing, like a, from the kid, from when the kids were, well, the kids are kids, since they were young, we always validated their feelings. Like you mm -hmm. feel angry. It's yeah. okay to feel angry. And I want the listeners to understand this because I know I was raised that whatever I felt, <laughs> I didn't have the right to feel that yes. either I overreacted or I deserved it or anything like that. So even as adults and especially as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. with the shame part, we know the shame's going to come because it's habitual now, right? Mm -hmm. It's you've just been doing it for so many decades. It becomes a habit, but it's okay to feel those. Mm -hmm. And what I learned after my diagnosis, it was my emotion or my feeling was not the problem. It was my reaction and my actions after was the problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, and the, at the root of that problem is that, is that your tools are not effective because mm -hmm. you haven't been taught like they are now in kindergarten, trying to teach people how to act out in ways that is not going to harm themselves or others and mm. it's going to be more effective at the end of the day right so so for me the big key is when i you know i got the diagnosis and once i got over my uh the depressive part of the you know once i stopped grieving and just said i'm going to take ownership of this now i started doing the research yeah. um when i got into the emotional part when i read you feel emotions a thousand to a million times more than anyone else that just to me validated everything that I felt my whole life. And yeah. once I understood it was the brain part, um, to me, it went, whoa, that's just the way my brain is. I'm going to feel every emotion intensely, no matter what. And that's why Andre, and that's okay. That's okay. That's also why people love people with ADHD, right? Yeah. Because when we feel happy, 
Yes. Yeah, they love to, us to be around. Yeah. Right? Like we can infect a stadium room, a like stadium of people with our, our emotion of joy. Yeah. It, For me, yeah. that was a night and day thing. So mm -hmm. to me, it says it's okay to feel those emotions intensely. And now that I know and realize that they're short lived, mm -hmm. now I just, now after diagnosis and with the awareness, I give myself a little more time now to try. I try to slow down my reaction. I know it's intense. So if I wait just a couple minutes, how do I feel after that? So you're bringing up a key, key point, which is not always easy to implement. No, um, it is not. And, and so, you know, I, one thing that's going to help you right off the bat, and I think I, I, I asked at the beginning, like, you know, what was it like uh, feeling your emotions before you were diagnosed? So, mm -hmm. you know, one key thing, so tell me what, what has it, so you're telling me what it's like for you, uh, for how you've been feeling your emotions after getting your diagnosis. Was it just the diagnosis or was it treatment as well? Treatment helped. Um, so when we say treatment, I did, I did one-on-one -on -one therapy. I did uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, but yeah. for depression. Yeah. So if you are going to be going towards CBT, it's also known, try to get that geared for ADHD. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a slight nuance to it. It is, but it's not really out there as much. So I would tell anybody like any CBT course you can get into, yeah. do it. Oh, no, for, that's a very good point. You're right. Um, and then I'm also taking dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, uh, which is um, right. gives us the skills, but tries to remove our black and white thinking and to deal with the gray. So mm -hmm. a lot of that did help it. But a lot of it just for me is the awareness. And I've always been a trigger person. I've always identified triggers since mm -hmm. I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that. So like right now, after diagnosis, I sit the, at the office, what I start telling people is, is do not, if you ask me something and I react, just ignore that reaction. It's a gut feel. It's a gut reaction. It's my brain not stopping me. Just ignore it. And after, you know, just ignore maybe the first couple of minutes and then start paying attention because that's just a gut reaction. Then my brain goes, wait a minute, maybe it's not that big of a deal. And then now we'll, consciously well before i would just keep going what you're what you are talking about right there is your metacognition um and Medi i always explain it to people as your third eye metacognition your meta metacognition okay. it is your ability to catch yourself in the moment right and okay. or a few seconds later right and and this is what keeps people with adhd up at three in the morning when they're oh, yeah. reviewing, reviewing yeah. a conversation from when they were in grade seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Don't laugh. I know. That's what I tell people. Yeah. I, let's have a conversation or I meet with a client and then I come back three days later saying, I need a lot more questions. Like, well, how do you remember all this? Is the, the conversation gets replayed in my head nonstop for three days. Nonstop. Yeah. And I got the details. I got, I know what's missing now, yeah. but the metacognition was never described to me that effectively. So that makes a lot of sense to me. But yeah. I think the other thing too is I don't hide it. I don't hide the ADHD. I went to my staff. I got ADHD. This mm -hmm. is the kind of things. If I do this, like a, a couple of my shorts, like I did one short about, I don't always say hi in the morning. That mm -hmm. was me talking to my staff saying, when you come in first thing in the morning, I've already been here a couple hours. I'm in hyper-focus mode and I don't want to disrupt my hyper-focus. So I'm not ignoring you because I'm just being an idiot or yeah. rude or poor myself. It's just... I know I have to keep focusing because if I yeah. disrupt myself, it's going to take another two hours to get into it. Yeah. And that that's where I, as a therapist, at the, at the, the ADHD therapist, I teach people how to learn how to trust Yeah, that you, if you are on the right medication and you've done the treatment. So you didn't earlier when I was like, what do you define by treatment? And you mentioned the therapeutic treatment. Mm -hmm. I was also hoping to hear you say the, the medication, the medication. medication. I was, I have had medication. I, I agree that medication is part is part yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing too, a huge part is awareness and you yeah. actively yeah. doing something about it. Yes. And having and a growth mindset, not a victim mindset that I can't do anything about it. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think that once you have those two treatments, then you can move into a place where with practice you are, but a lot of practice, 
your metacognition muscle is growing. And that's going to give you ability to pause so that you can respond in a way that is more consistent with the behaviors you value instead of react. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're reacting and you're acting out in ways that's not consistent with behavior that you value or how you see yourself. Right. It's this, like, I didn't mean to say it that way. I didn't mean that. And this having to Mm -hmm. explain yourself to others. And Mm -hmm. to learn how to advocate for yourself and explain it. Now, the other thing too, is everything you said is correct, but there's one aspect here that just hit me, which is, it's very key because you can have all that. And you mentioned the therapy, the medication, the metacognition uh, and the awareness and you wanting to do it. But if you're not surrounding yourself with people who support you through this, it's almost a waste of time. So if you don't um, have a supportive environment that will help you with the metacognition mm -hmm. observes, you know, say, oh, okay, I understand. Like my kids tell me, oh, we know this is an ADHD brain thing right now. It's not Papa doing this. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But it's very important to have the right environment. So. I 100% agree with that. It was the topic of the group that I was running this week. Um, and I do a full one hour of the pros and cons of disclosing and the legal rights right? Um, and how to get accommodations, you know, and all that jazz. Um, I, I think that it's a, something I would caution. Um, and it is, a like I said, I could talk on it for quite a long time. There's caution around... This. And I agree. And I agree with that. Um, yeah. cause I know a lot of listeners here, I actually, I know it's quite a few listeners are not entrepreneurs and do not have their own companies mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur. You own the company. I think self-disclosing doesn't really matter. You can do it. at your company. There's no repercussions unless you think there's some, but the majority you're a lot safer than a lot of listeners here who work for people. Mm-hmm. Yes. A workplace, um, what was the fancy word you use? Disclosure. Um, that is a tough one. And I can't comment on that because I've never been an employee. I was an employee maybe for about a few hours mm. in my whole life. Um, but yeah, it's a very good disclosure. It's still brand new. It's, it's a tough, that's a tough one as yeah. if you're an employee and I agree with yeah. that. And so the one thing I want to talk about um, is that, so, you know, you were talking about, so learning about it, um, so, you know, in that practice and getting the treatment, but what happens is how do you learn to get to the place where you can pause and act in a way that is consistent with the behavior you value? Yes. You got to understand what your emotions are. You got to understand how to do mindfulness. You got to understand what are different tools that you can use that are going to be more effective. Um, but the, the key thing that I've noticed through my work um, for the last three years of, of specializing in this in this area uh, under uh, psychiatrists um, where my other work is um, is that it's the the false what we call the false promise of avoidance so okay. when you are feeling something so intense and you're like I can't feel I don't you know I can't feel this squash it Mm -hmm. yeah you're getting close to the edge and falling over you're like squash this feeling I can't deal with it and then you don't express it you don't allow yourself to feel it what you're teaching your body as it's rising like a wave Mm -hmm. is you're teaching that wave is not safe your body doesn't know your body and brain does not know how to cope with it stop Mm -hmm. it from happening yeah and what I tell people is if you are squashing anger or if you are squashing sadness because you don't trust your ability to bring it in because it's so big when it comes in, you're also squashing joy. You're oh, squashing, for sure. Yeah, right? you're delaying joy. Yeah, right. you're That's learning funny. to squash your emotions and squish them down and freeze them. And so a huge piece of the learning part of how to contain and feel your emotions in a way where you feel in control and you can act in in a a way that's consistent with behavior Mm -hmm. that you value is to learn to sit so that's where we often you 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 may have people may have heard this but is you ride the wave 
of that emotion. You allow that emotion to rise up and come back down and then rise up and come back down because as waves do until they hit the shore. Right. And, and that's really scary to do at first. But once you do that, the first time you do that, the wave that used to be 10 feet tall, like that really, really intense anger, the next time, because if you allow your body and brain to see that you can sit with it in a way that is safe, so you do it in a low, intense environment, the next time that wave comes on in your life, it's going to be felt at like, you know, a, a five foot, as a five foot tall yeah. wave. But it still comes a lot with awareness. If you're aware of that, that you can ride oh, the wave, of course, then you can. Yeah. Exactly. So, so like, my yeah. favorite and free tip, a free therapeutic approach that people can take for this. And it is the, to me, the most important tool, if you have ADHD is mindfulness. And I cannot stress this enough. And in, if you just Google yeah. or search, mindfulness meditation is a big game changer for me. It's, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I want, I, I'm like, I don't know how much time again. I don't have my timer on. Yeah. I would love to hear your experience with that. But I, I just want to say, if you search um, guided, you always want to do guided. If you have yeah. ADHD, yeah. your brain is too active. Yeah. I use a headspace app. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. So yeah. That's a good one. And what I found is once I realized I got, I'm a hyperactive adult, which is also rare, but um, everyone told me I got to learn how to relax. You know, one therapy was you got to learn how to relax, but then I says, I can't physically relax. So to me to try and relax is a waste yes. of time and failure. So with mindful meditation, I discovered, I now search for calm. If I can just calm my, my mind down so I can go to sleep, I do that. Or if I, now I start a new meditation, I think it's, it's going to be a short soon, or probably by the time you hear this, it is a short, but I start to do it in the morning now, just so I can get my brain calm so I can plan my day Amazing. and start it. So, and it took about six months before I start seeing a change. That's, that's exactly. So, so and it takes so time. There's no hack. There's no immediate fix to all this. It's all about management. Yeah. And it, mindfulness is a huge piece of dialectical behavior. Oh, yeah. so whether, yeah. whether you, so you probably through practice, like being forced to practice it, force. <laughs> um, mm. I say that with quotations because you're, it, you know, the therapist is going to make you practice it in session. Y you are then uh, like, you're learning that it, as much as you fear or don't like having to calm or to calm your brain, um, that you actually can do it. If somebody's instructing you how, and you talk about afterwards, mm. yeah what was difficult about that so a lot of people who try and just jump into to doing mindfulness on their own struggle and they never get past doing it once because they're like you know i you know i want to swear right now but yeah you know, well, <laughs> like, but the thing is the mind like the headspace app there's a course beginner's course and steps you through it and gets you improving and like to me Meditation was always voodoo crap. Like I just say, yeah, whatever, whatever. Cause I always knew even before I was diagnosed, there's, you're supposed to sit there and not think there's no way I cannot have a thought. Mm -hmm. So what's the point of trying something I'm going to fail at, mm -hmm. but the mindfulness yeah. meditation is it's okay to have a thought. Mm -hmm. It's catching the thought, realizing you just had a thought. Mm -hmm. It's like a blow the cloud away and then bringing back concentration to your breath. In this case that I do. And apparently just that task, that mental task helps you neuroplasticity, grow your brain mm -hmm. to slow things down and calm down. So it's okay to fail. It's okay to have a thought. It's okay. Like they tell me in the apps, did you have a thought? That's okay. Just push it away and get back to the breath. Oh, did you have another thought? That's okay. So now it's like, it's okay to fail. And for an ADHD brain, when you're being told you fail your whole life, because you're not like everyone else, to me, that was rewarding. But it took six months before I saw a change. Yeah. And that's what it is. So when I'm explaining mindfulness to people, I tell them, just as I'm explaining, that your executive functions are all a bunch of muscles yeah. in your brain. And right? That's exactly it. And you grow the ability right. to do it. Right. And so, so 
when you when you are doing a mindfulness exercise, I think this is something that may not come through through a podcast because uh, it's more of a visual thing. But you know, I say you're if I'm using my hand and I'm throwing my hand up in the air and saying these are your thoughts, and so your thoughts are I don't want to do this. What's wrong with this person's voice? They need to take a drink of water. What kind of accent is that? So you're in your thoughts as this is going on. And then all of a sudden they're like, can you feel the breath on your upper lip? And then my hand, which is like my thoughts, comes to my upper lip and I'm in my body and I'm feeling that sensation of air on my nose. It's making you present and to concentrate on something else. And then you go back to your thoughts and you're like, hmm, maybe that was interesting. Who was it that suggested I do that? And and then you're, oh yeah, that work thing. And you're back in your thoughts. And then they say something again, like your feet on the ground. And then you your thoughts go down, like I'm pulling my hand down to your feet. And if you were to see me physically as I'm explaining this, it looks like I'm I'm working out. It looks like I'm doing push-ups mm. or or pull-ups, right? Yeah. And so I I I often say, you know, if I went to the gym once a week to you know build this muscle this bicep muscle um in three months time what would my muscle look like pretty much the same yeah but if i do it every day if i went to the gym every day and i worked on that bicep muscle Mm -hmm. in three months time it's going to look good it's gonna you're gonna see some change happening right and so it's the same thing with your ability to press that pause button yeah so that pause. you can react the way exactly. yeah, and be present and exactly. then the other thing too it's not a practice you can master and perfect it's all about improving it's a practice mm-hmm. it's called a practice for a reason that was a big game changer for me you're yeah. you're always you're not going to do it 100 yeah. percent. get over it but if you can just have a good run at it today that's good exactly so, and so. what i like that you said is that you like to use it you do guided and you like to use it to fall asleep too is what i think i heard you say well i don't use it to fall asleep i get it so that my brain slows down so i can fall asleep so either or what i tell people is if you put it on at night and it's part of that nighttime routine so it's it's in your body's in a habit yeah that so so you're pairing it with something you're already doing so it's more likely to happen and if you fall asleep within the first two minutes, you went to the gym for two minutes. Yeah. For your yeah. mindfulness muscle. Yeah. That's and, a great analogy. You got, and you got the bonus of falling asleep. Okay. Yeah. And that's always good for us. Right? Yep. Oh, man, we can go on this for hours, but unfortunately, our time is up. But the one thing I want to reiterate here that I learned today was the emotion, it's part of a thought, a physiological reaction, and an action reaction. Mm-hmm. And if I'm going to think of this as an engineer, I have a feeling if I can just pull one of those things out of that formula, we'd have a little bit better control of the emotion or the reaction. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, sure. Yeah. Cool. And then for me, the one thing I really worked on to get my emotions under wrap was identify a trigger that would initiate a large um, reaction. And then I start, and then once I've kind of mastered that trigger, then I actually went to the next phase. I start, I get early warnings in my chest or different parts of my body saying something's coming. So you just got to listen to your body. Mindful meditation is a big part to get to that physical sensation and understanding. Um, But yeah, just the awareness that we intensely feel emotions a thousand million times stronger than others. It's okay. It's what we do and react causes a positive or negative consequence mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and it's and, not easy the, you can never perfect it but as mm-hmm. long as like to me is if 80 percent of the time i do it well i succeeded mm-hmm. and and what i wanted to just say there is that when you're practicing them you you're practicing and you said you practice it and then you master it you're practicing at a low intensity and mastering yeah. that low intensity yeah. uh, trigger. So you're you not, create a habit. Yeah, you're yeah. not you're not starting practicing controlling your anger with a high, in a high triggering situation. No, exactly, and yeah. that's key. Great point because you you can't. It's hard to master something when you're over the edge. But if you do it at smaller intensities, yeah. then you can create the habits because you're more conscious of it. 
and and you're learning to ride that wave of that emotion yep. and trusting that you could do it in a way that is safe and not going to harm other people or yourself. Yeah. yeah. And that's key. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Santina. If you want to get more information about the uh, ADHD therapist, you can find it at the ADHD therapist.ca. Mm -hmm. Santina, thanks again for your time. It was a great discussion about emotions and the mm -hmm. entrepreneur. So thank you very much. And thank to you. the listeners, um, Please share this episode with other people you think this they would benefit from, or even if you're an ADHD entrepreneur or an ADHD person that would help explain your emotions to others, share it with them and please share it with at least two people. I would really appreciate it and leave a comment. That'd also be greatly appreciated. Thanks again. And we'll talk to you soon.